Well, thank you for having me. Um, uh, technology is wonderful, although I think I need my 12-year-old daughter here to help me with this. She's better at this kind of stuff than I am. Um, so if I'm slow to do anything, please uh, forgive me. Um, but thank you for having me. Uh, like uh, she said, I'm uh, uh, Tad Gorski. Um, I've been working in uh, the Division of Neuropsychology and Rehab Psychology for about the last almost four years now. Uh, for a little over 20 years, uh, just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my, uh, my work was in addiction and mental health, working with uh, patients with a dual diagnosis of a psychiatric and substance use disorder. And I worked with them in various settings, including inpatient community mental health, uh, worked in the prison system for a short period of time, uh, and then worked at a specialized dual diagnosis clinic here in Pittsburgh um, with uh, Dr. Dennis Daly. Uh, before I came over to this department and uh, I've been doing neuropsychological testing for maybe about 12 to 13 years um, and so I'm very happy to uh, you know bring this to you and uh, hopefully give some information um, now what I don't know is how many people are actually addiction providers versus traumatic brain injury providers so I'm going to try to cover uh, a broad range of material here on both topics uh, and I'll try to remember to stop around every 15 minutes or so for any kind of questions. So um, let's go ahead and get right into it. Um, so in talking about addiction and TBI, I think one of the first things I'd like to do is talk a, a little bit about uh, traumatic brain injury and uh, what all that is about. Um, so to start off with is the definition of what is a traumatic brain injury. Um, and actually when we talk about uh, brain injury, I'm actually going to be speaking fairly broadly, um, talking about things like closed head injuries um, where basically you know the, the head is hit and the skull is intact, is not exposed, uh, yet there's obviously significant damage which we'll talk about. And so basically in a closed head injury the skull uh, uh, is, remains intact and the uh, internal systems uh, also remain in place versus a penetrating head injury such as with a gunshot wound where the is an actually an open head injury where the skull and parts of the uh, the brain and the uh, membranes around the brain are actually penetrated uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that versus a vascular insult which is due to something like a stroke or anoxia where there's a lack of oxygen uh, which is not a traumatic injury but it is more on the lines of what we call an acquired brain injury uh, no less devastating in most cases, but uh, or some different types of brain injuries. So uh, for purposes of definition, I think those are important. Um, the Center for Disease Control uh, provides a definition of uh, brain injury, which I'll go over here. Is basically is considered a craniocerebral trauma, uh, an occurrence to the head, either from a blunt penetrating trauma or some kind of force that's associated with different symptoms which you can read for yourself there include decreased level of consciousness uh, neurological or neuropsychological problems skull fractures etc so basically you have an, an assault to the head in some way that leads to a number of different symptoms and one of the reasons that this kind of definition is, is important is because up until the time that we are able to actually look inside the brain, scan it with a CT, MRI, etc. Uh, really the determination of a brain injury is made obviously by the type of injury sustained but also the type of symptoms that a patient presents. So as I go throughout this I'm going to try my best to apply it to uh, if you're a practitioner in the community and you're seeing these patients and you want to know something about their history in relation to brain trauma, what are the type of things that you're going to be looking for to determine what kind of injury they had, how severe was it, things along those lines. Because as we get into more issues of like treatment, uh, when we talk about addiction and TBI, you'll see a lot of patients who may say to you, oh yeah, at some point in my history I had a brain injury, but what does that mean? And how severe was it, and is it the kind of injury that may have actually had an effect on their functioning? And that's part of the reason I want to go through this, is so we can kind of get in a things to look for in order to make those kind of determinations. So just a little bit of uh, epidemiology here as far as the prevalence of TBI. You can kind of see the numbers here anywhere between 50 to 75,000 deaths 
uh, between uh, 230, 373,000 hospitalizations, significant long-term disability, uh, and you know nearly two million individuals are attended to at medical settings related to brain injuries. Now, this does not include what we would call more mild brain injuries or concussions, uh, which, as we all know, has been an important topic lately with uh, sports, uh, the NFL, hockey, and so forth. Um, but these are more along the lines of more severe brain injuries. Overall incidents around every uh, about 220 people out of every 100,000 uh, may sustain some type of brain injury. So it's a fairly, fairly frequent and uh, obviously considerable public health concern. So who are the people who uh, sustain these type of injuries? Um, well, there, as you can see here on this graph, these are approximate rates per 100,000. And of course, these numbers will vary depending on what research you read. But you can see there's two main points as far as age groups here. You see uh, around here the teenage to young adult, and you see the elderly. Um, teenage to young adult, you find uh, again, it's going to be predominantly men. Um, that good old testosterone that gets in the way as far as doing high-risk behaviors, motorcycle, motor vehicle accidents, ATV accidents, uh, you know, accidents that occur during periods of intoxication, uh, things along those lines. So uh, along the lines of accidents, high-risk behaviors. Up here with the elderly, you're going to see things like falls. Okay. Uh, a lot of uh, elderly, especially during the winter time, uh, when it becomes icier, um, they find they're at risk for falling and, of course, sustaining a head injury. You'll see the smaller point here with uh, small children, um, of course, who have accidents, falls, injuries, things along those lines. But the two major uh, elevations here are the young adult and the elderly. So who are the people? Obviously, we have the children who are at risk you know, because they, they don't know any better and they do dangerous, risky things. We have the young adults who often we think don't know any better still and continue to do dangerous and risky things. And then, of course, the elderly who might be at risk for falling. Um, especially with the elderly, you have to look at premorbid medical conditions that might be affecting balance, um, you know, their mental status and things like that. So again, the types of uh, incidents that occur that could lead to a brain injury. Uh, you have the most frequent being transportation, such as, again, uh, automobile, uh, motorcycle, unhelmeted ATV. I've seen more unhelmeted motorcycle and ATV accidents than I care to see. Uh, seeing somebody who's gone through that, who has stitches in their head and has uh, been comatose and unconscious for a considerable amount of time, when you know they just, if they just have worn a helmet, there's a good chance that they may not have sustained that uh, level of injury. Um, and then falls, and then firearms assaults, and uh, other ones within that. So the estimated cost of TBI, uh, again, depending on the statistics you read, can be up to $260 billion in the United States alone. Okay. So talk a little bit about uh, mechanisms of brain injury. Um, there's two main mechanisms of brain injury that I'd like you to be aware of, and it's what's called the primary injury and then the secondary injury. The primary injury is the immediate damage that occurs uh, as a result of, we'll talk in the case of traumatic brain injuries, when there's an actual trauma to the head, to the brain. So there's damage that results immediately um, from what are called shear forces. Uh, shear forces uh, also which is similar along the lines of what's called axonal injury. Let me go to the next slide to kind of illustrate that. Basically, the way to understand that is the brain, in whenever there's a trauma, essentially the forces that occur cause it to rotate within the skull and basically bounce around within the skull. Uh, if, I, if you could see me, I could give you a little visual of what that looks like. But basically, when that happens, these rotational forces cause the axon or uh, nerve nerve uh, systems to stretch and to tear, uh, which obviously creates you know, numerous problems in and of itself. And uh, those are called axonal or shear injuries. Um, there we go. And those, of course, uh, cause a lot of damage in and of themselves. Um, then there's you know obvious disruption to the brain. There's damage to the cerebrovascular system. There's hemorrhaging, bleeding, 
But then you have what's called secondary injury, which is even more important because it's the things that occur within the brain after the actual injury itself. And these are concerns anywhere up to hours, to days, and sometimes even weeks following the actual injury itself. Again, you can have continued swelling. You can have continued axonal injury or death. You can have actual cell death. Um, excitotoxicity refers to the fact that chemicals are released that actually kill brain cells. Uh, inflammation, which affects whether cells can regenerate. There's the basic thing I'd like you to take from this is that a, a traumatic injury is a very uh, damaging, uh, often very nasty, ugly process that can occur. And as opposed to what a lot of people think, say you get hit at one part of the brain and that's where the damage is, that's not what happens at all. Because of all these different things that occur, an immense amount of damage can occur within the brain that doctors and uh, other professionals have to keep tabs on while the person's in the emergency room in order to make sure that they are not uh, you know, progressively worsening due to these various uh, things that happen due to the injury. Okay, I kind of talked about closed head injury and open head injury a little bit already. Um, the thing, another thing to think about when we talk about with penetrating injuries, such as with, uh, you know, bullet wounds, uh, the most uh, well known, of course, being Congressman Gabriel Gifford, who re sustained a gunshot to the head, uh, and you know, is going to have lifelong challenges ahead of her as a result of this injury. And again, part of the reason is, is when you have a projectile that goes into the brain, it does just not affect the area that it hits because when the bullet goes into the brain and through the head, energy is created. And that energy has to go somewhere, and the brain is enclosed in the skull. So that energy basically is uh, emanating throughout the brain and causing damage. Uh, in addition to the fact that projectiles usually spin when they come into the brain, and that in itself causes damage. So again, we're looking at a not just uh, damage due to the actual incident or trauma itself, but the biological things that occur within the brain that cause damage as well. So the main thing I like people to take from this is that a brain injury is a very complicated, rather nasty, and uh, very damaging process uh, that affects a wide range of uh, abilities that a person has. Okay, I'm seeing it's about 2.15 now. Um, would you like me to stop and entertain any comments or questions at this point? Um, I don't have any uh, comments or questions yet. I was wondering, do you want me to um, to do a poll? You know, to see how many people um, to see how many people are um, treatment providers. Um, perhaps, it, yeah, that would certainly be helpful. Um, but uh, would you would, uh, would you rather I just continue to move on here and then? Uh, totally up to you. Yeah, I'll I'll go ahead and uh, move on here okay. and then get through this part and then uh, I'll and then I'll stop again. Okay. Okay. Um, so again, just to follow up, a, a brain injury is a biological event that occurs within the brain and can lead to a number of different complications: tissue damage, bleeding, swelling, cell death, stroke, etc. So. If you're a provider and you are working with somebody who comes in front of you and they say, you know, you know, they're in treatment, say, for example, for drug or alcohol use, and they're saying, oh, I had a brain injury. Um, and, well, so you want to ask them essentially what that means. And, you, and it's also helpful to look if there's any previous records that are available to look at to see exactly what they mean by that and what the extent of the injury was uh, because, you know, are we talking about a simple uh, bump to the head where there really wasn't uh, any real intervention or any kind of problems, or are we talking about something where they experienced some of these types of events? Um, and one of the events you have to worry about most is where is when you have any kind of swelling or bleeding or hematoma or hemorrhaging within the brain, uh, you have to worry about what happens there because this is a critical uh, event that occurs because whenever there's any kind of uh, swelling or hemorrhaging within the brain, remember the brain is encased in the skull and if there's swelling or pressure the brain has to go somewhere and the risk that it has there is it could become 
herniated, which right here basically means it's going outside of the skull in one of the, the holes, the main one called the foramen magnum, which is down here. Uh, the other risk you have is, here's an example of a CT of a normal brain. You can see it's relatively uh, symmetric. Uh, things are pretty much in their proper place. But if there's any kind of hemorrhaging or swelling or any kind of bleeding, you can see now the brain is literally being pushed okay, to one side. Okay? Uh, it's being uh, pushed over here to the left. This is a CT scan where right is left, left is right. And this is a life-threatening event that requires surgery in order to get rid of this and relieve this pressure and can lead to death. Um, so this is an indication of a, of a fairly severe head trauma. Um, and so those are the, the other kind of things you want to look for when a person says they've had a brain injury. Uh, did they experience any of these types of complications? So now, one of the, again, one of the problems uh, that providers have with understanding brain injury is uh, how do we know how severe it is? Aside from, you know, when you look at a CT scan and you see things like that, it's pretty obvious that, you know, it's a severe injury. But uh, and really, at this point, um, the best way to determine the level of severity of a brain injury is what kind of symptoms the person presents with. And there's a number of things that we look at. Uh, we look at the level or loss of consciousness or coma. We look at what's called post-traumatic amnesia, which is basically a period after an injury where the person is not only not remembering things, but simply not forming new memories and oftentimes maybe confusing memories and is very disoriented as to where they are, time, dates, so on and so forth. But the, the key thing there is the inability to take in new memories. And then some other changes which we'll talk about. Skip that one there. So how do we measure severity? Um, we measure severity by how long they were unconscious. Uh, we use things what's called the Glasgow Coma Scale, which I'll show you in a second. We use length of post-traumatic amnesia, and there's also one called the Rancho Los Amigos Scale. I'm just going to show you a couple of these. This is the Glasgow Coma Scale, where basically you're looking at, you know, in what kind of responses do they give you? Do they open their eyes, uh, whether spontaneously, whether you talk to them to pain, or are they not doing it at all? Do they respond to you verbally? And how, and how so, and are they making any kind of motor responses, moving their extremities in some way. And this is on a scale of uh, 0 to 15. And so we have a mild injury, or what we might call a concussion. Usually there's about anywhere from 0 to 20 minute loss of consciousness, very brief loss of consciousness. And when they come to the emergency room, their Glasgow coma scale, or, yeah, Glasgow coma scale is usually around a 13 to 15 and post-traumatic amnesia period where they're not taking in new memories is usually less than 24 hours. So there we consider that a mild uh, brain injury uh, and it also tends to be synonymous with a concussion. A more moderate injury when you have about 20 minutes to 6 hours of loss of consciousness, Glasgow coma scale is lower, which indicates you know they're not responding to you as well uh, between 9 to 12. And then a severe injury is when you have greater than six hours loss of consciousness and a Glasgow coma scale of three to eight. So again, if you're a provider and you ask somebody, you know, how severe was the injury or you're looking at records, these are some of the things you're going to be looking for. What was their Glasgow coma scale? How long were they unconscious? How long? One of the things that I ask uh, patients is what's the last memory you have and what's your next clear memory? It's not the best, uh, the most valid way of assessing how long you know, they had memory loss, but it, if, it, if it coincides with what I read in the records, it's not a bad assessment. Um, and then the other thing you have to look out for, too, is you'll see sometimes something like Glasgow Coma Scale of 3T. Uh, 3T basically means they were intubated, they were having respiratory problems, and they needed help breathing. And sometimes that usually means it's not a great assessment of their uh, level of consciousness because they usually had to be sedated in order to do that. So after someone has a moderate or severe injury, what happens um, as far as recovery is concerned? And what are some of the issues we look at? We look at the issue of plasticity, which is the ability of the brain to recover, regenerate. How can we as providers enhance that? Uh, although it's a controversial idea and you know, the definition is not quite clear, but we understand that the, 
the brain and the central nervous system is dynamic. And one, one of the things, after an injury, there's a saying that, you know, we, we need to set up conditions so that the brain can do its own healing. And what can we do to either, one, get out of the way of that or help that along? Um, and so that's usually when we're getting to issues of rehabilitation. Uh, you know, what are some of the things that we try to do in order to help that? Um, now, one of the questions I often get from patients, which is a, a heartbreaking question, and one I wish I had a better answer to, but uh, is, you know, when can I expect to get better, or when can I expect my loved one to get back to normal and get better? And I always have to start off with saying that I'm really not going to have a good answer for that, uh, because we just do not have very good predictions as to when someone will get better, how much they will get better. In fact, in the, in the brain injury world, we have a saying to family members that we, you know, we ask them to hope for the best, but to plan for the worst. Um, because especially with more moderate to severe brain injuries, uh, you know, the amount of recovery is, is never quite certain. I've seen some patients who I thought were going to be nursing homebound, and they made dramatic recoveries in one to two weeks. I've seen patients who I thought were going to do better than they did, and two years later, they're still having significant deficits. So having said that, we have a few guidelines. Um, a lower Glasgow coma scale score is, is, tends to not be a good uh, prediction, a good prognosis for recovery. Now, having said that, I've seen people with Glasgow coma scales of three, four, or five, and have made marvelous recoveries. But in general, that's, that's one predictor. The longer they're in a coma, usually greater than four weeks, uh, is not a good sign. The longer the uh, degree of post-traumatic amnesia, um, good recovery being unlikely if they have a uh, post-traumatic amnesia three months or greater. Um, older age tends to be associated. You know, the younger people are uh, generally a bit healthier, and they have uh, a little more uh, resources uh, physically and so forth. And, regard, and what types of neuroimaging, CT scan, and so forth show whether there's been hemorrhaging, uh, a shift in the brain, uh, you know, whether it's epidural or subdural, uh, you know, depending on how severe those things are, could lead to worse outcomes. So what are some of the cognitive impairments we often see after traumatic brain injury? And again, these are fairly... Uh, widespread, there's, a, there's, there's no one common type of brain injury, but uh, having said that, there's some things that I can, I can comment on. I talked about post-traumatic amnesia, which again is that period where they're not taking in new memories. So whenever we see patients on an inpatient unit who have a brain injury, one of the things that we look for in neuropsychology is when they're clearing of that. Um, because that's, you know, when they clear of it and uh, you know, is oftentimes a good sign as to what kind of recovery they might have. But the kind of impairments you'll see after a TBI are varied. I mean, memory is, of course, the number one thing that is, is usually a problem. There's always some kind of memory deficits. Um, you know, it, and then uh, the other things is uh, the term down there, executive functioning. Executive functioning refers to the front part of your brain, which is your brain CEO, I like to term it as. Um, is responsible for things like judgment, problem solving, being flexible in your thinking and so forth, the higher level uh, functions. Um, social behavior, you know, a lot of family members will describe how their loved one is changed in some way. Oftentimes there's more agitation, sometimes irritability, sometimes depression. There's a wide variety of, you know, psychiatric issues that can occur. Anosognosia is basically a fancy way of saying unawareness or denial of deficits. Um, now, where that becomes a little bit sticky is when we get into addiction more. You know, in addiction, the, there's the term denial, uh, where you know, you know, how do you know an addict is in denial? Well, usually their lips are moving. Um, but anosognosia is a bit is different. It's more of a neurological type of denial where the person, the brain, is just not allowing the person to get it not allowing the person to understand or comprehend what's going on. So there's a qualitative difference there. So these are just some of the different types of impairments you might see. 
a rehabilitation program for brain injury is uh, we try to be very comprehensive, uh, including physical therapy for get them back on their feet, work on various, you know, uh, on uh, walking, ambulation, movement, using their hands. A lot of times people have fractures. A lot of times people have nerve damage, so, and, you know, physical therapy, you know, the quote, rest is rust, really applies there. We try to really get them moving. Occupational therapy helps them uh, perform activities of daily living. Speech therapy helps them with their cognitive processes, their memory, and so forth, helps them work. And a lot of times with brain injury patients, there's uh, speech and swallowing problems. Uh, a lot of patients will have deficits in swallowing, and they'll and they'll try to shove too much food in their mouth, which puts them at risk, risk for aspiration and choking. Uh, then obviously medical management, uh, emotional family support case management, and of course psychological and neuropsychological rehabilitation, uh, which is you know where people like myself and some of the rehab psychologists we have here in our department come in. So. And I'm going to take a little, I'm going to stop here in one second, but I'm, as we get through this process of rehabilitation, you know, uh, just as by way of introduction, um, so we go through this process of brain injury rehabilitation. I will usually see these patients up to maybe three to four months after they've been through our inpatient rehab unit, seeing them hopefully at the best they've been in a while after an injury like this. and. Uh, you know, so I, I do testing with them, see how their cognitive mental capacities are doing. And one of the challenges is people want to get back to their regular life. Um, and depending on how severe the injury was, how well they're doing, how well their recovery is going, you know, those kind of things, you know, may or may not be possible. Um, but one of the questions I often get, I've had a brain injury, can I have a drink? And that's now where I start to move into a little bit more about the connection between brain injury and addiction. But before I do that, I'd like to stop here. Uh, it's been about a half hour now and see if we have any questions or comments up to this point. No, I'm really surprised. Nobody's been asking anything. So I've asked them to please give us comments. And I'm sure that as you get into the addiction section here, we will get more. Thank you. OK, so hopefully. That means either I'm making complete sense or I've lost them totally. Hopefully it means I've, I'm making sense. Um, so let's get into this part now. Uh, again, like I said, the, the question I'll often get uh, when I see patients who've had a brain injury, I've had a brain injury, can I have a drink? And that is actually a seemingly easy question with a rather complicated answer. Uh, and I'm going to go through some of the reasons as to why it's complicated um, because there's a lot of things to consider in regards to uh, this question and the relationship between addiction and TBI. So let's go ahead and jump into that. So first of all, um, you know, I, and by the way, before I move on here, I'm going to be basing this information not only off some research that uh, I've gone through, but also my own clinical experience. Um, just a little bit, again, my own clinical experiences, I see people who come from our TBI unit uh, and, you know, a number, one of the common factors that uh, is related to people, you know, suffering a TBI is that alcohol is often involved, oftentimes other drugs. And uh, so I'm going to, as I talk about some of this research, I'll also be throwing in some of my own experiences in there as well. Uh, and so hopefully that'll uh, be clear as we go on. So the evidence shows that, yes, they are related in some way. Um, and some of the ways to consider that is that there are several studies that show that uh, after a TBI, people show a decrease in drinking. Okay, But there's other evidence that shows individuals return to pre-injury substance use. Uh, now, my own experience has been that if you there, – there used to be a thought that after a brain injury that substance use increased. My own experience with that is uh, that depends on what the substance use was like before the injury. Uh, in other words, if I see somebody who is completely abstinent, sober, never had an issue with drugs or alcohol before the injury, it's often fairly rare that I've seen them have a problem with it after the injury. On the other hand, if somebody has borderline substance abuse dependence before a brain injury, 
uh, they are at risk for going back to that level of drinking after an injury. Um, I just saw a gentleman recently who I saw about a year prior uh, because he had a, uh, a stroke and along with that he was a heavy, heavy alcohol user. And as we went through the session and I was challenging him a little bit uh, and challenging his, his spouse, it became clear how heavy his alcohol use was, although he continued to minimize and deny it. Well, what ended up happening was is one day he was drinking too much and he ended up uh, falling downstairs and sustaining a serious brain injury. Uh, and it was at that time when the spouse later disclosed to me when she went down into uh, the basement where he was that they, she found numerous empty whiskey bottles. Um, so, you know, this, is, this has a high correlation uh, with people who uh, have premorbid substance use. They are, they are at risk for developing a TBI and people who you see who have a TBI um, and are using substances abusively, there's a good chance that was in their history beforehand. Along with those lines, people who are in substance abuse treatment programs, uh, anywhere between one to two-thirds of them are going to report having brain injuries. Uh, now, the, pro the problem with that, with the study there is, is that when, again, when we talk about brain injuries, what do we mean? Well, the studies didn't really decipher that too well. Most of the studies, um, when they determine whether they ask somebody if they've had a brain injury, that's pretty much what they do. They ask them, did you have a brain injury? And they'll say yes or no. Um, and maybe they'll go so far as to say that it led you in the hospital and they'll say yes or no. But again, that really doesn't tell us much. Um, so one of the things we don't know is when we're talking about one to two-thirds of people in substance abuse treatment are saying they have brain injuries, we're not sure what level of severity we're talking about. Um, and a little bit like I mentioned before, that individuals who drank alcohol are shown to have four times the risk of sustaining a brain injury than those who did not drink alcohol. So the, the risk here, the relationship kind of goes both ways, is if you're drinking abusively or you're using substances abusively, you're putting yourself at risk. If you have sustained a brain injury uh, and you are, and after a period of time you've, you're, you notice they're going back to uh, a high level of substance use, there's a good chance that that was in their history beforehand. Okay. Um, and the first comment there I've already, I've already mentioned as far as pre-injury, uh, but the next one, both TBI and substance use disorders, in addition to pre-morbid mental health problems, can cause cognitive and behavioral problems. So what this means is we, we have a challenge here when we're talking about people with, I'll call it the dual diagnosis of TBI and substance abuse, because uh, people with TBI and substance abuse are or people with TBI alone are going to have cognitive problems, um, but people with substance abuse are also known to have cognitive problems as well. So trying to weed out, you know, a little bit what is what can be a, a real challenge. I've seen patients who have come out of a TBI rehabilitation, and they're looking pretty darn good. They haven't gone back to substance use, but I know that their history, they, they have had heavy, heavy alcohol and possibly other drug use, and I look at some of their test results, and some of their test results look very similar to people who I've tested who had drug and alcohol problems, as opposed to TBI. There's certain things in there that I've seen and I look for. Um, and so, again, one of the challenges is trying to weed that out a little bit, but even more so, just kind of giving our patients the feedback that, okay, you know, you're now, with this substance use in the mix, you know, you're now putting yourself at higher risk, and you're also putting yourself at higher risk for uh, worse thinking or cognitive problems. And so just knowing how those two uh, relate to each other is, is important for that knowledge to our patients. So some of the other risks, persons with TBI and substance use are less likely to be working, um, just overall feel worse, lower subjective well-being. Uh, there is an increased likelihood of suicide. There's a greater risk for seizure. Um, as I mentioned before, one of the risk factors for a TBI, uh, or excuse me, one of the um, risk factors following a TBI is the development of a seizure disorder. Uh, and, and again, in my own experience, is those patients who go back to substance use or go back to abusive use of substances, alcohol, drugs, and so forth, uh, increase the likelihood that they may experience a seizure. Um, and, of course, every time they have a seizure, they lower their seizure threshold, which makes the problem even worse. Um, the additive effects of negative consequences for brain structure and function. What I tell 
the patients is that because of all the different types of damage that occurs following a brain injury, uh, when they ingest a substance like alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, whatever the case may be, the way to look at it is that whereas before, you know, their body, their brain might have been able to filter that a little bit, now the, the alcohol, we'll say alcohol has a free reign to the brain. Uh, and because part of the problem with brain injury is damage to the vascular system, now the alcohol just sort of has a free reign to go into the brain and do whatever it needs to do and cause whatever damage it's going to cause. So people who have had a brain injury and they go back to drinking will often describe they get high quicker, they get drunk quicker, uh, they get dizzier, they get more nauseous. It's like the alcohol just seems to affect them so much more than it did before. And what I tell them is that's also a sign that the alcohol is potentially going to do more damage. Um, and so that's one of the other risks. Um, and then the final thing, persons with no history of pre-injury substance abuse were more than eight times more likely to be employed to follow up. So if a person has had a brain injury without substance abuse, they are eight times more likely than those who have had substance abuse to get back on their feet and possibly uh, develop some kind of you know, meaningful vocational uh, life. Okay, just a few more uh, things here that I, a couple I've already gone over. Um, life satisfaction, employment, higher risk of seizures, and increased criminal activity. There is some evidence that uh, people who have the dual diagnosis of uh, TBI and substance abuse have higher risks of criminal activity. Okay, so um, just to go over a few uh, pieces of research here that uh, um, you know would be important to know as far as uh, you know prevalence. There is a, a study, Walker and his colleagues, they screened over uh, nearly 8,000 adults in a substance abuse treatment facility in Kentucky, uh, and they self-reported a number of head injuries. Now, again, here's where we, as I mentioned earlier, we have a problem of, de of definition of what a head injury is. The way that they understood self-report was that the persons described being knocked out or kept in a hospital at least one night. Um, again, you know, that's interesting, but it doesn't tell you a lot as far as wh what type of brain injury they had, how severe it was. Given all the things that I just went over with you, you know, and all the factors to consider, that's really not a lot of information. So that's just a limitation of the study that you have to consider. Um, and also another limitation was the authors indicated screening was more likely to identify severe versus less severe TBIs. Okay, so that's just a little bit about the screening. Um, and basically the way to read this graph here, uh, just real, sim real simply, is uh, what they looked here is the amount of substance abuse over a 12-month period, um, depending on and how much of it occurred, depending on whether they had a TBI or not. So if you look here, these are the, uh, these are the numbers that they looked at, um, and um, the amount of, uh, the number of months of substance abuse over the past 12 months. This is for those who had no TBI, who had one TBI, and who had two or more TBIs. And what I can tell you is that zero to one is not significant. Zero to two or more is significant. In other words, those who had two or more TBIs used significantly more alcohol or other drugs than those who had no TBIs. Okay, uh, but when you get to one or two or zero to one, that is not significant. Okay, so basically those who had two or more TBIs used significantly more substances over a 12-month period. Similarly, they looked at mental health problems over a 12-month period, same way, and again, people who were reporting um, mean number of symptoms over a 12-month period, and again, same pattern existed. Those who had two or more TBIs had significantly more depression, anxiety, and so forth, and those who had none. Uh, and again, zero to one was not significant, one to two was not significant, but zero to two or more had significantly more mental health problems. So I've, basically what you're looking at there is if somebody is talking about having two or more TBIs and is in a substance abuse or mental health treatment or a dual diagnosis program, uh, they're probably going to have more severe symptoms than those who did not have any.
This is a very busy slide, I understand, and I'm not going to go over it all in detail, um, but it's the most common cognitive effects uh, of, first of all, a TBI. And, you know, you can see a number of different things there, what are called, we call frontal executive processes, looking at that front part of the brain, things like attention, memory, mental flexibility, all sorts of other things. But then you look at all the potential cognitive problems with substance abuse, alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, opiates, polydrug users. So there you have, again, the issue of trying to figure out kind of the chicken or the egg question here. Um, one of the things that makes the most sense to me is if you're familiar with the uh, work of uh, the Center for Education and Drug Abuse Research uh, here in Pittsburgh, it's run by uh, Ralph Tarter, and they've looked at this concept called emotional dysregulation uh, as being a risk factor for substance use. Basically what that means is people who have this risk factor, this emotional dysregulation, have trouble managing emotions. They, they have trouble, you know, monitoring, managing, keeping an even keel, if you will. Um, and along with other factors as well, those kind of things are thought to be at risk for developing substance abuse. And those, that emotional dysregulation is thought to be related to the front part of the brain as well. So why would that be important? Well. If you look, I skipped two slides here, the common areas, brain structures affected by a brain injury. And it pretty much screams right out to you here. This is the front part of the brain right here. Okay, You can see where that's the one that's most affected. Um, and part of that is, is partly the way that the brain sits inside the skull, partly the nature of injuries. So you have basically a group who uh, has this emotional dysregulation, has this tendency to have a hard time managing emotion, has this kind of frontal executive difficulties, and now they have a brain injury which is going to lead to the same kind of thing uh, in addition to all the pro consequences that drug abuse ca causes, in addition to all the problems that psychiatric disorders can cause with cognitive processing. Here you see depression, bipolar disorder, uh, other non-psychotic dual diagnosis. They, there's a wide range of thinking problems that occur. So you're, de you're dealing with a group who is at risk to begin with for thinking problems. Now you add the brain injury on top of it and you've just sort of exacerbated all these problems. And going back to our original question, this is the group that's going to come to you and say, can I have a drink? So and you can kind of envision here where our, where our answer is going to lie. Um, but that's a little bit about the nature of you know, the group that we're talking about here. Okay, I see it's 2.46. Um, it's been another 15 minutes. I thought maybe I should just pause and just check in here. Actually, you have generated some questions here. Okay, great. Uh, and, and I think some of these are variations of the studies that you've already gone over. Um, do you have statistics on how many TBIs occur while someone is intoxicated? I do not. I do not have that, um, but I would be more than happy to research that and try to try to get back uh, to that if that's uh, available for me to do. I don't have any specific numbers on uh, how many uh, TBIs are directly uh, substance abuse related. Um, just so everybody knows that after this webinar. Um, one, you'll, they'll be getting a copy of the slides, and you've also supplied us with some uh, resources that they'll be getting. And if you have any more, just send them to me, and I'll forward them on to all the attendees. Um, okay. The next question is, do you have any statistics on the number of women who have sustained TBI as a result of intimate partner violence? Ooh, and great question. The second part is, um, um, what are the most frequent types of TBI do they sustain? Okay. Uh, statistics, no, a very statistics-minded group here. Um, no, I do not have specific statistics on intimate partner violence. Um, if it's, it's valuable to you at all, I can give you a little bit of my own experience on that. Um, I've seen a few uh, uh, women who have sustained, uh, you know, domestic violence uh, injuries. Uh, I've not seen uh, 
anybody who has sustained what we would call a severe TBI related to domestic violence, although I know they exist more along the lines of a concussion uh, or a series of concussions uh, related to intimate partner violence. Um, so as far as actual statistics, no, I don't, I'm afraid I don't have that. Okay. Um, here's another one. Uh, how do prescription medicines factor in? I work with a lot of TBI survivors and nearly all report poor sleep. Many are prescribed sleeping meds and others use marijuana. I'm curious, curious to learn what you think of how these may impact TBI symptoms. Okay, how do I think prescription medicines impact TBI symptoms? Um, and the, there's another part to that question, which is also how does marijuana factor into this? Okay. So the, the first one is, is how does prescription medicines factor into it? Yes, there's, a, there's different medications. And also, just as a, uh, as a caveat, I'm not a physician, so I can't really offer advice on medications, but I'll tell you what my experience is from what I've seen. Um, is there's a series of different medications that they use for uh, brain injuries. One is to help the brain injury recovery, such as a drug called amantadine is a very common one. Uh, it's designed to help with the uh, neurotransmitters and such. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes they'll use things like SSRIs to help with emotional symptoms of a brain injury. As far as for sleep, I think was one of the, one of the areas the question targeted is uh, obviously none of our physicians prescribe marijuana for sleep. Um, usually the things they'll prescribe are things like uh, Ambien or Trazodone. Uh, marijuana certainly has the risk of getting in the way of brain injury recovery because one of the things that uh, marijuana is attracted to is fat and one of the areas that has the most fat in your body is your brain. And so basically the marijuana essentially just clings right onto that. And in and of itself, marijuana has shown to lead to a number of cognitive problems. And so uh, I would say that, you know, while I understand that there's a group out there that is very passionate about, you know, marijuana is safe and that, you know, it's helping me, it helps my symptoms, you know, I would argue that especially in the case of a brain injury, you're risking doing more damage and slowing down the recovery and that there's other medications out there that are... Uh, I have found to be uh, quite effective according to the patients I've talked to with helping with sleep. Okay. Um, with what happens in the brain after head injury, um, is there anything that would cause a person with years of sobriety to relapse? Good question. So um, the, the biggest uh, worry you would have with that, I think, is that as they make a reasonably good recovery if they're still having a number of symptoms such as dizziness, dizziness headaches, uh, chronic pain. Uh, chronic pain is a big risk factor following brain injury because you know there's usually a number of other injuries, fractures and so forth and uh, one of the risk factors there is that people often get addicted to painkillers. Uh, you know and so there's one risk factor there uh, the other issue is is that with some patients, depending on how much recovery time we're talking about beforehand, uh, oftentimes if the brain injury is severe enough, people may have trouble remembering what that they were actually in recovery or what kind of recovery they had, and they may actually be operating from a time when they were still using after the injury, if that makes any sense. Um, because of the level of you know memory disorders that uh, occur and the level of memory disorders, so oftentimes there is the risk of people going back to that only because they kind of feel like they're starting from a new place. There's a lot of symptoms, um, and there's they honestly may forget a significant portion of their life. I've known people who have not been able to remember anywhere up to a year or more of their life after a severe brain injury. And it's possible they could not even remember that they got into recovery. So that's, but that would be a very severe brain injury for that to happen. In most cases, I see what leads people back is excessive number of symptoms, chronic pain, uh, and just looking for some kind of relief. Okay. Um, here's one. Uh, it's, a, it's another two-parter. Mm -hmm. Will you speak to the issue of individuals who experience numerous concussions or mild TBI 
and the relationship of age at time of injury with development of the brain. Okay. Um, okay, so the first one is speaking to people who have had multiple concussions. Yeah. Um, I guess I would, there's a lot of things I could say about that. I don't know, was there a specific question about that? Or would they just kind of like me to just... No, maybe we'll just ask them to uh, go into more detail, and I'll go on to the next one. Okay. Um, what do you think um, the results of a TBI would be, uh, depending on the amount of drugs impacting the brain at any one time? And again, that's sort of vague, too. We might need more. Discussion. Yeah, because there I guess I would ask, are you talking about uh, if the person was high or intoxicated at the time of injury? Are you talking about if they use after the injury? Um, there's, a, there's a couple things I need some clarification on there. Right. Okay, well, we'll give them time to, uh, to type in um, with more clarity, and um, you can go on, and then we'll just get back to these at the next break. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, I apologize there. There just there was a couple of the questions that I, I really could I could really give a lot of answers to. I want to make sure I'm answering correctly and I'm answering what you want me to answer. So I asked for a little bit of clarification there. Um, okay. So, the, we ended up with talking about the major structures that were affected in. Uh, and TBI and some of the the functions that um, may be affected. So let's see. Okay. So now we're going to just move into. Um, so when we're trying to identify a substance use disorder, and for many of you, uh, based on some of the questions, it sounds like there's a fair number of addiction providers in the audience. So this may be a little bit old hat. Um, but uh, you know, one of the questions is, is uh, how do you identify a substance use disorder post-TBI? And the identification is usually about the same as, as pre-TBI, but there's a few things you might need to consider, and let me just go over a few of those things. So the first one, obviously, is tolerance, which is a need for increase in, uh, markedly increased amounts of a substance to get the desired effect. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, people who drink post-TBI often find themselves uh, being affected quicker. Um, and, uh, you know, drinking after a TBI is one of the risk factors for developing another TBI uh, because when you, if you drink or use any other, you know, kind of uh, depressant uh, for that matter, what's one of the first symptoms that occurs is imbalance. Um, you know, the alcohol hits the cerebellum, the legs start to wobble, you're not, you're not as steady, you don't ambulate as well, and next thing you know, people fall and they re-injure their head. So. I mean, one of the number one reasons we might see somebody come back into the inpatient unit for a re-head injury is oftentimes drinking or intoxication. Uh, and again, that's because oftentimes because, uh, you know, they haven't made those changes and because, uh, you know, the alcohol affects them quicker. Uh, withdrawal is manifested by, you know, whatever types of substance use you're talking about. You know, with alcohol, of course, you have sleeplessness, you have, you know, um, you could uh, possibly have shakiness, tremors uh, on more severe levels, delirium tremens, uh, seizures, and so forth. Uh, but here, th let me talk a little bit about opiates uh, for a second, because as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is uh, one of the class of drugs that is often prescribed uh, for people who have a TBI, especially if they have other injuries, other orthopedic injuries, is uh, things like painkillers, narcotic-based painkillers. Um, and for a fair number of people I see, that's not a big issue. I mean, they, you know, they take some painkillers until they get to a certain point or they don't need them anymore and they stop taking them and, and things are fine. But, uh, you know, for a, for a sizable number, you know, those painkillers could potentially become addictive. Uh, often my own experience, again, is that, you know, there was some addictive potential prior to the brain injury. I don't, I haven't seen too many people with absolutely clean, non-addictive histories who suddenly become addictive, although it does happen, don't get me wrong. Um, and so there the thing you need to watch out for is that uh, one of the uh, uh, changes that's coming in with the upcoming DSM-5 is looking at the meaning of some of these withdrawal symptoms because just because you see withdrawal symptoms in somebody who's either tapering or coming off of the opiates is not necessarily a sign of addiction. Uh, you know, 
you know, it's where where the challenge comes in is when you see someone with chronic use, uh, and you know, they may start to do the doctor shopping. They may start jumping around. And in addition to the symptoms that they're having after a brain injury, now they have this developing opiate uh, dependence and, and periods of withdrawal. Uh, and then you have you know, a clinical issue that needs addressed. Um, an example being is I saw a gentleman who had a, I believe it was a moderate severity brain injury, um, seemed to be making a pretty good physical recovery but he was continuing to have what were termed as post-concussive symptoms, which includes things like uh, memory problems, attention problems, dizziness, headaches, nausea, possible vomiting, uh, ambulation problems. And uh, so, you know, I, he was sent to me for a neuropsychological evaluation to try to determine what was going on here. Why was this was, you know, a, well over a year after his injury, was he still continuing to have these symptoms even despite all the medical intervention and so forth? And so I started talking to him and I started looking a little closer at some of the painkillers he was on and I started asking him a little more detail about the withdrawal symptoms he was having. And as he started to describe them, they were more and more sounding like bad flu symptoms. And if you know if you know about working with people who abuse opiates, one of the a, a withdrawal from an opiate is kind of like a bad flu, um, it, or it feels like a really bad flu. You have the achiness, you have just feeling washed out, feeling horrible. And I I started pressing him as to his pattern of usage, and over time his story was changing on me. Until by the time the interview was over, I said I realized that he was and he and. Uh, he even admitted to me he was starting to get opiates off the street, uh, and so you know the one of those are one of the things that uh, you know providers and physicians need to really watch out for, and it really is important that they communicate with each other as far as you know the person's pattern of behavior with these types of drugs, and looking for the characteristics of these withdrawal symptoms, uh, you know, to determine what might be going on. Um, the other ones, uh, again, most of you probably know, substance taken in larger amounts over a period of time, and persistent desire and successful attempts to control or cut down. Now, the challenge you have here with brain injury, again, is I talked earlier about the difference between denial and anosognosia, which is a more neurological type of denial. It can be hard to distinguish the two, um, but in the more uh, you know, emotional denial, Again, it's 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 just that it's it's something. It seems to be something where the person, on some level, may know what reality is, but is just trying emotionally to deny it. And as you start to chip away at that, you start to hear the the, the fear, the frightening, uh, you know, consequences that they're anticipating if they were to make some kind of change. Versus in anosognosia, the person just simply doesn't get it, um, and the brain won't allow them to get it. Uh, an example would be as a gentleman I talked about a little while ago who had a stroke and a TBI. He was in a restaurant and he was uh, out with his wife and he'd actually been clean from alcohol for a number of months, uh, which was verified by his wife and you know, by all accounts it seemed to be uh, accurate. And then as he was sitting there at the dinner table, um, despite the fact that multiple people had told him you cannot drink and you know, his wife was there, his wife was checking on him, you know, everybody kind of knew what was going on. He just went up to the bar and ordered a drink, an alcoholic drink. And of course, the bartender, not thinking anything of it, was certainly happy to you know provide it. But fortunately, the wife caught it and she created a big scene in there. And then the bartender immediately took the drink away. And in talking to the person about this, uh, and again, I have no reason to not believe this is accurate. At that moment, he just simply did not have a clue that that was not okay to do. Um, he wasn't trying to hide it because he just walked right up. He was out in clear blue open. Um, it just wasn't clicking in his head that this was somehow not okay, and he was just kind of going on an impulse that he had. And that might be a good description of what ano anosognosia is like, where they just, again, mentally, physiologically, neurologically can't get it for some reason, but again, he would, of course, when his wife confronted him, he, he backed down and he did not, ended up not drinking. Um, the other one, this is based off the DSM, as I'm sure you know. Um, great time and activities to get the substance, uh, important social occupational activities, and use despite knowledge. Now, 
With TBI, some of the challenges you get in here is, for example, if you have um, a patient with a severe TBI and they have significant memory problems and they may be confused, they may be disoriented, a lot of times these patients are, even though they're having all these kind of neurological problems, are kind of operating on a level where they're going, they're operating the same way they were before the injury, but at the same time, unbeknownst to them, they're disoriented, confused, and you know, very impaired. So you'll have a you'll have a patient who'll be at home, and they don't get why they can't buy some beer or buy a bottle or have a fifth or you know have a toke or whatever the case may be, uh, and they really don't get it. It's not that they're you know trying to fool anybody; they just really don't get it. Um, and one of the challenges with family members is trying to tell them that look trying to instill insight is probably not going to help. In fact, it might make things worse. I've had family members tell me how they've had drag out fights between themselves and the patient because of they're not allowing them to have this behavior and they're trying to drill in this insight that they cannot do this and the patient just is not getting it. Uh, again, not any fault of their own, it's just their brain isn't allowing them to process this. And so what do they do? Well, a lot of times the answer there is really a lot of behavioral interventions. Um, reinforcements, redirecting the patient, trying to guide them away from what it is that they want, in this case the drug or the alcohol, and just really not trying to get emotionally too charged by drilling in insight because that tends to make things worse and again the patient is just not understanding it. So a lot of we wor I work with patients on a lot of behavioral types of interventions in those cases um, because it says continued use despite knowledge of persistent physical and so forth. The patient may not know that. The patient may not comprehend that. Um, and again, it's important why it's important to know the things that we talked about before with level of severity of brain injury because then you may have some clues to be able to distinguish that. If you talk about somebody who's had a minor concussion, just bumped his head a few times, and is now claiming anosognosia, neurological denial, that's highly unlikely. Okay, That's highly unlikely. And you're pr they're probably just looking for a reason. But if you're talking about somebody who had severe brain bleeding, hemorrhaging, was com comatose for a period of time, was amnestic for months at a time, was in rehab, uh, skilled living facilities, so on, or excuse me, skilled nursing facilities, then you have a better case for saying, okay, this is probably a neurological denial. Um, there's no hard and fast way to determine that. There's just some of those guidelines I threw at you there. Okay. So what are some of the risk factors for developing a substance use disorder in TBI patients? Well, one is young age. Again, those young guys have a lot of testosterone full of beans who you know uh, can conquer the world and they can feel pretty invulnerable um, so I, I see a fair number of you know late teen early 20 year olds who uh, again usually related to being intoxicated got into an accident or a fight or something along those lines and uh, you know they ended up developing a, a TBI and then they Usually, a lot of these young guys, they make very good physical recoveries. Um, I'm talking about guys, but it happens to girls too, but more so I see uh, men. Um, they make very good physical recoveries because they're basically in good health and so forth, and, uh, and then they want to get back to right where they were. Um, you know, An example would be a young 20-year-old I saw who uh, was assaulted while intoxicated, sustained a f fairly moderate to severe TBI made a very good physical recovery. If he sat in front of you, you'd never know anything was wrong with him. Uh, he looked fine. He talked fine. A little flat in his emotions, but he looked fine. Um, but it, you know, through the cognitive test scores, I could see there were some deficits, but there were also some areas of very good recovery, too. Now, this person also had a fairly lengthy history of multiple concussions. So one of the questions was, uh, can I comment on, you know, multiple concussions and again I wasn't sure if this is what you wanted me to comment on but certainly multiple concussions in addition to a severe TBI are probably going to have worse outcomes uh, than obviously if those multiple concussions weren't there. Um, but anyway this is also a young man who engaged in a lot of high-risk behaviors as well 
uh, and also wanted to get back into sports and things like that. And you know, I basically had to tell him. I said, you know, your your contact sports days are over um, because one more good shot or one good shake to your brain would be, you know, not good to put it lightly. Um, and he had a very hard time hearing that. Um, he had a very hard time hard hearing that you know he shouldn't be drinking at this time. Um, and so those kind of things are risk factors. You know, someone who's young age, who, who is young, and basically again healthy, and you know, kind of wants to get back on, you know, with their life. Um, prior history of high frequency substance abuse, as I mentioned. Um, as I mentioned, it's really unknown regarding the effect on the recovery process. It tends to set people back in most cases. Uh, decreased tolerance for any drug. Again, people who just tend to have that. Uh, their bodies don't tend to tolerate the use of any kind of substance very well. They tend to have either a lot of side effects, they tend to be affected quicker, the type of people who may not do well with any kind of medications. Um, and then you add the TBI on top of it, now you're talking about extra sensitivity, which of course is going to possibly lead to uh, a delayed recovery. Um, you have to watch for interactions with other medications. Again, you'll have people who are on anti-seizure medications and they want to go back to drinking. Um, and I, again, I can't sit here and emphasize enough that that's that's bad. <laughs> um, it's uh, they should not be drinking, uh, let alone if they're having seizures. But certainly, if they're on seizure medications. Um, but again, if you have someone who has a premorbid substance abuse history, I mean, that's going to be something as far as a risk factor. Um, the potential for seizures, and I mentioned already that using substances has a potential to lower the threshold for seizures. Um, exacerbation of TBI sequela. One of the uh, use of substances, again, we talk about, for example, uh, with concussions, or what we call mild traumatic brain injuries. Um, and usually with most concussions, with a single concussion, about a three to six month recovery is what you're looking at. Uh, most people are going to recover from a concussion within three to six months. Um, so you'll see that with most athletes. Uh, you know, they'll get a concussion and they'll usually be in pretty good shape you know, uh, anywhere from a few weeks to up to three months afterwards. The difference is, of course, if they've had multiple concussions, okay, like uh, Sidney Crosby was an example who had multiple concussions. A lot of the NFL players have multiple concussions. Um, there you might see prolonged symptoms. But for the, uh, for the average person on the street, though, who's not a professional athlete, who sustains a concussion either from a, an assault, a hit, or some other kind of, uh, from some other kind of uh, injury, uh, the process is the same. They should recover within three to six months, but one of the factors that can prolong symptoms is substance abuse. So if you have somebody who has a premorbid substance abuse problem and they develop a concussion and they try to get back to regular life, which includes the use of substances, you're looking at prolonged post-concussive symptoms, which again includes things like uh, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, light sounds bothering you, uh, memory problems and other cognitive problems and so forth. Um, and the final thing, stresses of prolonged recovery from a serious TBI. Uh, recovery from a serious TBI is stressful, there's no doubt about it. First of all, for many people, your independence is, uh, is gone down. You have to rely on a lot of other people. Uh, and for Again, people who have sustained moderate to severe TBIs, uh, many of them have lost a significant portion of their lives. Uh, one of the strategies, if you see people in an inpatient TBI, is to put photographs, pictures around their room, because in those, especially in those early stages, they may not remember a significant portion of their life of who they, who they were, their, uh, where they lived, um, what their interests, activities were, and over time, that usually gets better. Um, but then once they get to a good point in their recovery, they've gotten better, they suddenly realize you know, they've lost a considerable portion of their life and they've been told they have this serious injury that they don't even remember. And that kind of stress can lead to things like depression, anxiety, and uh, those in and of themselves can prolong post-concussive symptoms. But if you have a substance abuse disorder on top of that and it was pre-morbid, then you have a risk factor for going back to that because now the person is under a great deal of stress, they're, they're, uh, they're upset, they, uh, they're grieving, uh, and they are looking for some kind of symptom relief and that may be what they're used to. They go back to what they're used to. Uh, 
one last thing, and then I'll uh, I'll break for questions again. Uh, risk for poor outcomes. Uh, patients intoxicated at the time of injury usually receive the most scrutiny, but the people who don't get a lot of attention are people who have a substance abuse disorder but may not be intoxicated at the time. So when I do my assessments, a neuropsychological assessment, I'm asking about their history, I'm asking about substance abuse. A lot of times people say, well, why is that relevant? I, and I, you know, of course it's very relevant uh, and I need to know, you know, what it was like beforehand so I know if there's a risk of them going back uh, that I might want to incorporate that into my education about their brain injury recovery. Um, the other thing is intoxication at the time of injury can lead to more severe injuries and lead to greater medical problems such as respiratory distress, neurological impairment. However, other studies have found the opposite, um, and I'm always kind of hesitant when I talk about this because I don't want people to get the wrong idea, but I have found that sometimes there is some information out there that alcohol actually in some ways can act as a buffer to a brain injury, and sometimes people make good recoveries who were intoxicated at the time of injury. That's purely observational on my part, and there are some studies that are beginning to look at that, um, but uh, it is just something to think about and to be aware of. Um, so there is, there is evidence for both negative and protective effects of alcohol at the time of a brain injury. Um, but again, the thing I go back to is that uh, if somebody has a substance abuse disorder and they go have a brain injury and they go through a recovery, they are at risk for going back to that substance use and at risk for putting themselves not only at a risk for re-injury but at risk for other medical complications that could hamper their recovery. Okay, so why don't I take a break here and see what we have. Uh, yes, we've got some good questions here. Um, Great. Does methadone negatively affect the way the brain heals after an injury? Um, I would say about the same as uh, any use of an opiate when you're talking about uh, using it for pain management following a brain injury, if it's used appropriately and it's used under doctor's supervision, uh, it, there, I'll be honest with you, it can slow down the brain injury recovery, but if it's used appropriately and the person eventually can wean off of it, it shouldn't be uh, as big of a problem, but the thing you have to watch out for again is uh, if a person is on uh, methadone, uh, presumably due to a previous opiate addiction, um, you have to uh, worry about them going back to that. Um, and so I would say, I don't, I haven't had too many patients, I've had a few, but not many who have been on methadone, uh, and usually it's due to, you know, for pain management. Um, and the biggest thing you have to worry about is lack of uh, supervision about how they're taking it and whether or not they're actually taking it appropriately. Because yes, it can slow it down, but if it follows a good course and eventually weans off of it, um, they should be able to get back on track. Okay. Um, any statistics in relation to professional sports, primarily hockey and football, of related as effects of multiple TBIs when painkillers, alcohol, illicit drugs, and continually are continually used after a TBI, players continue to blame leagues for not being educated on concussions. However, would the continued use of the drugs have a role in the player's recovery and life function after the career is ended? Um, yeah, boy, a lot of questions on statistics, which I'll be honest with you, I'm not very good at. Um, but I can tell you this, I can, what I can tell you is this. Um, yes, uh, players who use multiple substances following a series of concussions, uh, they do put themselves at risk for exacerbating post-concussive symptoms and doing continued brain damage. Um, usually, again, when you, have, when you have multiple concussions, you're doing damage right then and there, which is where the whole issue with chronic traumatic encephalopathy comes in. Um, the issue there being is you have athletes who are, have been subjected to multiple, multiple hits over the course of their career, and then they use things like painkillers, alcohol, whatever the case may be, in order to deaden the, the symptoms as a result of those effects. And those drugs in and of themselves, because they eventually they risk becoming addicted to, and in fact many do become addicted to, uh, which further can impair brain functioning and further uh, impair prolonged effects, cognitive effects of the brain injury. So you basically have the effects of the brain injury, um, 
the brain injury is not allowed to recover because of the use of the substances, and then the substances themselves cause cognitive problems uh, that just kind of keep steamrolling with each other. And when they, you talk about a lot of the older athletes, mostly NFL players who were uh, diagnosed with dementia and so forth, uh, supposedly due to con chronic traumatic encephalopathy, one of the problems they had is that these were not gentlemen who necessarily led clean lifestyles. Um, they were using uh, you know, addic substances addictively. They had other lifestyle factors in addition to multiple, multiple concussions. So it became hard to say that the concussions were the smoking gun because of all these other you know, comorbid conditions. Okay. Um, how would you say subsequent mild TBIs uh, years after affect an original mild TBI? You mentioned typical recovery of three to six months. Was that to mean a full recovery? Okay. Yes. In in most in most cases, uh, a, a single mild concussion, a single concussion, within around three to six months. Uh, most of the research shows, in the absence of any other problems. In other words, if they don't have any other medical issues. No other psychiatric or substance abuse issues. Just a single concussion within three to six months should make a close to full recovery. Um, and uh, most of the research in neuropsychology in, in my profession for, for those types of patients show limited to no cognitive problems uh, having had just that one concussion. Now, if a person has a concussion and has another one years later, um, hypothetically and, and based on experience, it should, uh, it should not be as damaging as opposed to if they were back-to-back -back concussions. Back-to-back um, -back concussions, what we call second impact syndrome, which is where a person has a concussion and does not fully recover and then has another concussion, those tend to create a lot of problems. But uh, then you have a person who has just one single concussion, makes a full recovery, and then has a, never has another one for many years, and then has another single concussion. Um, while I haven't seen too many patients like that, they don't tend to be as bad off uh, as those who have the second impact syndrome and have multiple concussions back to back. Okay. And um, the long-term effects of a TBI, can the effects like dizziness get worse as the years progress? Um, technically, uh, it depends on what severity of TBI you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about, you know, a mild to moderate TBI, the dizziness should uh, get better in the absence of any other medical conditions. Um, having said that, there are people with the more moderate to severe TBIs who may experience some level of dizziness for a prolonged period of time. Now the thing you have to watch for there is if there are other things that could be contributing to it, like vestibular problems, inner ear problems. Whenever they have they have a head injury, you may have damage to the eyes, to the ears, uh, to the uh, nasal uh, areas, to um, you know, to the back of the head, the cerebellum, the balance system. There's multiple medical issues that could cause uh, imbalance and dizziness. So the important thing to do is to make sure you've ruled all those out, usually with vestibular uh, assessment and therapy, um, because technically over time um, the dizziness should get better if there's no medical complications uh, added to it. Okay. Okay. Well, that takes care of the uh, the current questions then. Okay. All right. So should I keep going then? Yes, please. Okay. Um, all right, so we've talked about uh, risk for poor outcomes. Um, okay, uh, let me just finish up a couple things with that. Um, other risk for poor outcomes is again prior history of a substance use disorder, like I always said, like I said already. Um, people who some of the research says that people who have prior histories of substance use disorder is associated with greater mortality, uh, more, greater lesions in the brain following an injury, uh, a lower Glasgow Coma Scale score at discharge, 
um, and poor neuropsychological performance one month to one year post injury. Um, so basically, you know, people who have prior histories of substance use disorders, there's there's a good chance, again, depending on the level of substance use disorder, because again, if you go back into some of the research uh, that talks about cognitive problems with things like alcohol, cocaine, etc., usually what you're looking at is, uh, like for example, on alcohol, some of the research is mixed. Um, for example, social drinkers, there's some research that shows no effect whatsoever. Uh, yet there's other studies that will show you know, a cognitive effect with drinking. It usually uh, has a lot to do with, uh, you know, frequency, uh, number of heavy drinking days, years of drinking, uh, whether binge drinking is a part of it, and also whether there were medical complications along with it. Because a lot of times, a lot of those studies did not do a great job of also determining what kind of comorbid medical issues went along with the drinking. Um, so. But either way, if you have somebody who has a prior history of a substance use disorder, there's probably a number of other lifestyle factors that could have uh, contributed to uh, you know, various physical problems, including various cognitive problems. And when I, when I talk with somebody who's had a severe brain injury and I go into their history and I talk more about their history, um, you know, as they're clearing up and as they're able to remember more, they start telling me about you know, things that have happened throughout their lifetime, you know, other possible head injuries that were never treated, uh, overdoses, um, withdrawal symptoms, um, possible psychiatric difficulties, depression, anxiety, you know, all different things that uh, could potentially exacerbate post-concussive symptoms uh, as well as uh, hamper a brain injury recovery. Um, so again, knowing that prior history uh, is a big factor in understanding what kind of recovery a person's going to have from a TBI. Um, substance use following a TBI, um, just a few stats here, 10% of patients may use an illicit, illicit drug first year after injury, 25% are likely to have an alcohol use disorder, 11% likely to have a drug use disorder. Um, in the South Carolina study uh, that review, they, re they looked at um, about a little over 1,600 people. Um, and what they found was about 15% had heavy drinking in the prior month, 14% had a moderate level of drinking. The risk factor for heavy drinking after a TBI was pre-injury substance use, a diagnosis of depression since the injury, uh, better physical functioning, male, younger age, uninsured, and are on Medicaid or not married. So basically, there you're looking at the pattern or the profile of someone who might be at risk for uh, a development of a substance use disorder post TBI, you know, did they have pre-injury substance use? Are they younger male? Are there psychiatric complications? Uh, things along those lines, and they found similar patterns for moderate drinking as well. Um, in another study, uh, patients with a TBI consume more alcohol prior to injury than same age peers. So again, you have uh, you know the risk factor of alcohol. Uh, for developing a TBI. Um, after injury, they uh, reduced the level similar to peers. However, about one to two years post-injury, about 25% increased their use, which was also similar for drug use. So what came out of this study basically is that if you have, if you have someone who has a TBI and who is at risk because of a previous uh, substance use disorder, Chances are the first maybe year or so, they're going to decrease the amount of drinking that they're doing or drug use, uh, you know, again, because they've been through this major medical event, uh, a brain injury. It's been a very scary process, and they probably, you know, kind of pull themselves together a little bit afterwards, and they, they may be scared into sobriety a little bit. But once the recovery process goes on, especially, again, like I said, for those young guys who make good physical recoveries uh, and, you know, seem physically to be fine, um, once you get that one to two year period, that's your risk period. So if you're a TBI practitioner or an addictions practitioner and you're working with someone like this and you know they're about a year or so after a TBI, that's the time to start to begin to, to work with them and to start to you know, talk to them about substance use because that one to two year period is where it's most likely to increase and possibly get back to pre-morbid uh, levels. Um, and again, uh, Bombardier saw that 15% of patients with pre-injury abstinence or light drinking were consuming moderate or heavy amounts one year post-injury. So 
um, you know, when when asked about the group who doesn't uh, abuse uh, alcohol, you're looking at maybe around 15% in that at least one study uh, might start to use at uh, near abusive levels or uh, were drinking moderate to heavy amounts one year post injury. Okay, so now we're going to talk a bit about treatment. Um, and let me just preface this by saying is that at least in my own perception, uh, treatment for a dual diagnosis of a TBI and a substance use disorder is probably about where treatment for a dual diagnosis of a psychiatric and substance use disorder was about 20 to 25 years ago. Um, as I said, one of my I worked with dual diagnosis patients for most of my early part of my career uh, over we worked at the uh, Center for Psychiatric and Substance Abuse Services here at Western Psychiatric Institute. Uh, Dr. Dennis Daly was the uh, chief of that program, uh, as still is the chief of the program. Um, and, uh, you know, thanks to people like him and a number of other practitioners, they've developed, you know, methods, workbooks, uh, treatment designs for working with uh, dual diagnosis patients with psychiatric and substance use disorders. However, the TBI uh, substance abuse group is really at its infancy in knowing exactly what to do. Um, and so this is very much uh, a work in progress as far as the best way to intervene. So having said that, I'm going to go over with you a few ideas uh, that people have come up with and talked about as far as trying to help this group. And uh, most of the information does come from actually the dual diagnosis population, um, people with psychiatric and substance use disorders. So let me just go over a few things that uh, people have come up with. So as far as uh, treatment interventions, unfortunately studies are nearly non-existent. Um, there really have not been a lot of studies on the best way to treat this population. Um, however, uh, Corrigan, uh, who's probably done more work than anybody in this area, does have a study examining treatment engagement. And from that study, uh, there was some overall modest support for motivational interviewing and case management for treatment entry. Um, so now, if you're in the addictions world, you probably know a good bit about motivational interviewing, but since I don't really know exactly the experience of my audience here, I'm just going to go over it briefly. Uh, motivational interviewing is a uh, method developed by uh, Dr. Bill Miller and Stephen Rolnick. Um, it's, uh, its beginning started in the late 70s, early 80s with Bill Miller's experiences in the VA Medical Center and also with uh, uh, you know, his work with students. And basically what it is, it's a, uh, it's a change from what has typically been termed as the confrontation of denial approach, which has been seen as kind of more in your face, confrontational, need to break the denial of the addict in order to get them to change. Motivational interviewing's ideas, or that's not necessarily true, is that uh, oftentimes a balance between supportive, client-centered, empathic counseling at the same time encouraging the person to move along the change uh, process have been shown to be effective. Uh, and they do that through a number of different ways, the most, uh, the most important one being the ability to empathize with the patient, understand their experience, not that you agree with them, but that you empathize with them. But at the same time, you're trying to enhance their motivation for change by doing things such as exploring discrepancy between their behavior and personal values. Uh, weighing the pros and cons of their behavior, uh, looking at issues of how confident they are to make a change, how important it is to make a change right now, um, and you know, so very. And they there's a whole uh, there's a whole ma manual. There's a number of books about it. There's videotapes. Uh, there's a website uh, www.motivational.org uh, that describes you know some of the facets of motivational interviewing. So um, you know. I, I could I could provide an entire talk about that, which I'm not going to do. But uh, basically, there's modest support for doing that. Now, the problem is with motivational interviewing is because motivational interviewing is a counseling dialogue, you know, style. The the patient has to have pretty intact cognitive ability in order to do this. Uh, and as we've already talked about with the case with TBI and substance use, that's probably not necessarily going to be the case. So there needs to be adaptations, which people have worked on, and I'm going to go over what that might look like in a little bit. 
Um, the other intervention is case management uh, for treatment entry, where again, basically, you have a case manager who works actively with the patient, trying to encourage them, motivate them, and move them along, and try to do some resource coordination. Um, you know, especially for a lot of people with head injuries. You know, here in uh, in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, uh, we have a state-funded head injury program called Trickle. Uh, we have a number of cognitive rehab programs. One called Remed. Um, and uh, I work with some case managers who are very good, very dedicated, and really work to try to help uh, the patient with a brain injury get the resources they need. And so getting those kind of basic resources together is a big part of trying to motivate a person and trying to work with them as far as you know, uh, getting the kind of interventions and therapies and uh, help that they need for whatever issues they're dealing with at the time. Um, so as I said, there's modest support for those things right now um, as far as helping people along. Um, but as I said, it's very much in its infancy and we're really still kind of struggling with what the best strategies are to do this. Um, another, as I said, there's kind of mixed results for motivational interventions, but financial incentives and addressing logistical systemic barriers have resulted in better engagement, kind of goes with the case management approach. Uh, financial incentives kind of along the lines of uh, uh, like a behavioral uh, management intervention uh, in the addictions world, there's a contingency uh, management um, uh, where basically you've heard, probably have heard the idea where people who are addicted are either earn vouchers or payments for coming out with clean drug screens, things along those lines. And those have a lot of different, people have a lot of different emotional reactions to that, whether that's a good idea or not, you know, why should we pay addicts to be clean, you know, what's, what's that going to do? But when you get to, with the TBI population, especially with more severe TBIs, I think there probably is uh, some value to this because, uh, as I said, when you have patients with more severe TBIs, who have that anosognosia, which meaning the neurological denial where they just don't get it, oftentimes environmental, family-based interventions that are behavioral in nature versus trying to instill insight can be much more effective. And so things like incentives, whether they be financial or some other kind of reinforcement, I can really see could have a, a benefit uh, as far as trying to keep a person on the right track and not have them slip back into substance use. Um, now, uh, Corrigan, as, who, as I mentioned, has done probably more work than anybody on this, uh, has looked at the literature on dual diagnosis patients uh, and has come up with uh, some ideas as far as uh, how to, you know, begin to, you know, begin some kind of treatment program. Um, and so let me show you what that looks like a little bit. So this is a, a quadrant that he came up with. Um, and it basically looks at the different types of interventions that would be most appropriate depending on the nature of the TBI and the nature of the substance use disorder. So just kind of go over this. If you have someone who from a TBI perspective is low in severity, okay, so for example, uh, you know, as we've talked about the different risk factors, they had a high Glasgow coma scale, they were, they very short levels of loss of consciousness, post-traumatic amnesia. So the TBI was very mild in severity. And their substance use disorder may be mild in severity. They don't have a lot of complications. It's, uh, you know, there's no, there's borderline dependence, maybe no withdrawal symptoms. The psychosocial consequences are not severe. So that's where you have here quadrant one, where they may be best treated in acute medical setting, primary care, maybe do some screening and brief intervention, probably a good place for motivational interventions as well because they'll probably have the cognitive ability to be able to uh, respond to that uh, and you know, brief interventions based on MI would be most likely to be effective. But now you take it up to where you have a high, severe, high severity TBI um, and a low severity substance use. So in other words, the TBI is clearly the more severe and complicated and prevalent of the two as far as level of impairment. Then you're looking at quadrant two here, which is more likely they're going to be treated in a rehabilitation program specializing in TBI, which includes education screening, possibly some brief interventions linking up to resources, case management, and so forth. On the opposite level, 
you have a high severity TB, uh, excuse me, SUD, substance use disorder, and a low severity TBI, now you're looking at quadrant three, where again they're probably going to be seen in the substance abuse system, uh, using again screening, accommodation, linking, treatment, whatever the standard treatment is for you know the substance use disorder, whether it be MI, outpatient, inpatient, depending on what their needs are uh, as far as their level of substance abuse. Where it gets challenging now is here in this final quadrant, which is quadrant four, where you have high severity TBI and high severity substance abuse. Now is where things get a little bit muddier, where we have to admit we don't exactly know what we're doing yet, but where we have some ideas. But I think the biggest thing is about integration of the treatment programs. Just as with the dual diagnosis group, there needs to be an integration of substance abuse providers and psychiatric providers. In this kind of situation, we need an integration of the substance abuse providers and TBI uh, treatment providers. So, uh, you know, in the cases of like where I work right now, uh, we don't have substance abuse treatment providers. I may be one of the closest ones because of uh, my experience in substance abuse. But if I refer someone to some place like Gateway Rehabilitation Center, Greenbrier, CoForge, any of those places, uh, I certainly always offer myself as a resource to coordinate, uh, communicate, consult with the uh, addictions treatment providers uh, using what I know about a person's ability to function, about their cognition, in order to make the treatment experience as best as possible and suggest any adaptations that might be necessary. You know, just as an example, um, one of the symptoms that people with TBIs will often describe is they have a hard time dealing with a lot of stimulation, uh, a busy mall, a busy family gathering. Um, a busy intersection when they're a passenger in a car. Hopefully they're not driving at that point. Uh, they describe it as they'll become almost panicky, anxious, irritable, agitated, and it's all because the, the brain can't handle the stimulation. It's too much. It can't process it like the way it used to. Now imagine you take someone like that and put them in a group of 12 to 16 people in an addictions counseling group who are going back and forth talking about this, that, or the other thing. Um, you know, the person with the TBI, at the very least, is going to get overwhelmed and shut down. At worst, they may act out because they're just so anxious and agitated and overwhelmed with all the stimulation. So in those kind of cases, uh, on one level, number one, it may not even be appropriate for them to be in group, but number two, if they can at least handle the group to some degree, you may need somebody there to be checking in on them, to making sure they're processing information things along those lines. Even in a therapy situation, you have someone with a TBI, you know, if the standard 45 minute to an hour therapy situation may or may not be the best idea for someone like that, you know, because a lot is said, a lot is talked about in a therapy situation. And again, the person, if they're having deficits related to a TBI, may hear 10% of it at best. Um, and again, they may even be overwhelmed by all the information. Whenever I work with patients and family members and talk with them about you know, their TBI recovery, I'm always glad that they brought their family member there because I know they're not hearing 10% of what I say. Um, and so I'm always balancing between checking with them, making sure they heard main points, main themes, their understanding of those main themes, and then I go back to the family and tell any other details that I think they might need to remember. So that's where quadrant four becomes the real challenge and where we as providers have a real need to communicate, collaborate with each other as far as what the best types of interventions are going to be for these types of patients. Okay, before I go to this last part, which is just a few things about screening tools, I think now is a good time maybe to check in and see how people are doing. Okay, yes, I have um, two questions here. Uh, you mentioned the individual may use substances one to two years post-surgery is another reason, um, wait a minute, let me start over. You mentioned that an individual may use substances one or two years post-surgery is, um, is another reason for this self-medicating due to the inability to accept or adjust to the lingering symptoms from the injury. Okay, uh, so the question was is uh, for individuals who might use one to two years post, 
surgery. Um, I, when you say post surgery, I'm assuming you mean surgery related to the TBI. I'm sorry, or? Post, post injury. Post injury. Okay, thank you. Okay, now now that makes more sense. Okay. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, that is certainly a possible factor. Um, you know, there there's a number of reasons people could go back. One is just to cope with symptoms, like I said. Um, but the other is is people who suffer from TBIs deal with a lot of uh, psychosocial, existential type of issues. Um, their life has changed. They have changed. Their family treats them differently. There's a lot of emotional adjustment. Uh, and, you know, they might, again, I mentioned there might be a grieving process where they're grieving the fact that they just simply cannot do certain things that they used to do, and they might have difficulty accepting and adjusting to that. And the pain of that uh, is uh, something that could lead them back to substances. So yes, I, I fully agree, absolutely, that's a factor that uh, could be a part of it. Um, for me, that would almost be, uh, I don't want to say easier, but it would be almost uh, more workable because then you have someone who's uh, developed some emotional insight uh, into their into themselves and they're not happy with it. Um, one of the things that I tell people is where you might have the biggest challenge for a, a loved one who's had a severe TBI is actually when they start to get better and more insightful because then they start to realize, oh my God, what's happened to me? And that's a very critical time uh, for emotional adjustment um, and when, you know, it's it's really important to be able to seek out support and help, and when you know substance use certainly could become more of a risk. Okay, and uh, will you please clarify low and high severity SUD? Low and high severity SUD. Um, I th sure. I think. Uh, I mean, there's a number of ways you're referring to the the table here. I assume. Um, there is a number of ways to determine level of SUD, which I'm actually going to get into here in a second. But I think it would it could be anywhere from number of symptoms of a substance use disorder based on the DSM. The more symptoms one has, probably the more severe it is. The more number of the greater frequency and level of severity of psychosocial consequences, the greater number of physical consequences, level of you know dependence, level of withdrawal symptoms. Um, you know, so it's it's kind of a qualitative uh, factor as far as you know how has the person's life been affected. But having said that, there's other tools. Uh, for example, uh, the audit, the alcohol use disorders identification tests that are more objective types of tools uh, that you could use to develop level of severity. But really, it's it's about clinical presentation and uh, what kind of consequences medical. Uh, physical, psychosocial that the person is having that would most determine uh, how severe the SUD is. And um, that's it. So okay. continue. Thank you. Okay. So we only have a few more things to go here, and then uh, I'll pretty much be opening up for any other questions or discussions, I guess. So again, this this is probably more for uh, people who are not addiction providers. Those of you who are addiction providers are probably familiar with a lot of these things. Uh, when you're working with somebody who has a TBI uh, and you want to assess alcohol use disorders, what are some of the screening tools? Uh, number one are simple you know, questionnaires, the cage, have you tried to cut down, have you been a, one's asked you about your use, do you feel guilt over anything you've done while using, have you ever had an eye opener, that's kind of very, kind of an old fashioned uh, bedside kind of assessment um, to uh, look for red flags. Um, then there's some more formal assessments such as the the MAST Michigan Alcohol Screening Test and most of these by the way you can find online um, or the drug abuse screening test these provide more kind of objective quantitative measures of level of substance use severity uh, probably the most common one used in research is the alcohol use disorders identification test the audit again which is also uh, available online and there's some brief screening versions as well as some more involved versions uh, that are both uh, self-report as well as semi-structured interview. And then, of course, there's the DSM-4-TR criteria, soon to be the DSM-5, uh, in which you basically you know, use your clinical interview and look for different symptoms based on DSM. Um, I will say that as far as, uh, for example, um, when we were talking about motivational interviewing earlier, in some of the studies that I worked on, in addition to uh, 
that, that used motivational interviewing, one of the things that they used was a, uh, a feedback form where they gave uh, the patients feedback about different uh, symptoms, about different uh, diagnoses and so forth. And one of the things they gave them feedback on was whether or not they met the criteria for substance use or dependence. Uh, and they would do that in a way that was uh, open-ended, uh, empathic, but yet still gave them the information in order to try to, you know, gain, help them gain insight and uh, challenge any kind of denial that might have been there. Um, so again, a lot of this, though, uh, in the case of people with TBIs, uh, you may be using this not only for current levels of use, but also you may be looking for the past levels of use as well. So you might be asking uh, them and, pi and family members as well, because again, with the TBI group, uh, there could be a certain level of uh, memory loss, even from the past, that they might not uh, be able to give you that information, and family members' uh, information will be very valuable here in trying to determine some of these things. Um, I talked about some of this a little bit, just some of the upcoming DSM-5 changes uh, to think about. Um, and I don't claim to be you know, an expert on this by any means, but uh, just the proposal that diagnostic category include both substance use and non-substance use addictions, including things like gambling and internet. Uh, there's tentatively a retitle for the category addiction and related disorders. They're eliminating dependency criteria now limited to physiological dependence. And as I mentioned before about the issue of tolerance and withdrawal symptoms are not necessarily counted as symptoms to be counted for the diagnosis because withdrawal symptoms can occur even if the person may not necessarily be addicted, but they just, uh, again, in the natural course of trying to wean off something like an opiate. Um, so again, that's just a little bit more information there. Um, so again, going back to the issue of treatment, um, Martino in 2002 talked about some adaptations of motivational interviewing to dual diagnosis patients. And as I said, motivational interviewing has shown some modest uh, you know, help with working with the dual TBI group. And so I think some of his suggestions are also actually pretty good, and I'll just kind of run through them. Um, so with motivational interviewing standard practice, it targets substance abuse. Uh, in the modification, the, the address is the interaction and addressing compliance with treatment. So as similar with TBI, you'd not only be targeting the substance use itself, but targeting how the t substance use and the TBI are interacting with each other uh, and using those uh, issues as fruit for your conversation that we've kind of gone through. In standard practice, it assumes that the person is cognitively intact. Well, as we mentioned, that there's a very good chance that that's not going to be the case. Um, and so you may need to simplify your strategies. Uh, for example, instead of a 45-minute session, you may need to do a 30-minute or even a 20-minute session that incorporates things such as repeating the same thing over and over again, using very simplified materials and simplified language, making sure you take frequent breaks. Um, people who have had severe, moderate to severe TBIs and even to some level severe concussions uh, often fatigue easy. Um, because the brain is really working hard to try to make sense of all this information, but because it's been damaged, it can't do that, as well as any other physical complications that they might have. So, you know, I, I give people neuropsychological tests, and it's the most thinking they've done in months, and within like a half hour, they're, they're pooping out. They're ready to take a nap. Um, so you have to be aware of those kind of things. Um, so simplify, repetition, breaks, and make uh, the material that you use, you want to try to make it as uh, meaningful to them, to them as possible, that, like focusing on relevant themes and asking for their comprehension of what you said. Um, in standard motivational interviewing, uses open-ended questions and reflective listening, uh, which again is fine, um, but you want to avoid compound questions. Um, make your queries clear, concise, make your reflections simple, Using metaphors, things that you know the person can uh, relate to, can be very helpful. Um, there was a study, as an example, for they did motivational interviewing with people with uh, schizophrenia who were cognitively impaired. And uh, one of the advantages of motivational interviewing is that even though the patients may not have comprehended all the details of everything that went on in the session, they found the session very supportive, empathic, and very trusting, and they they very much enjoyed it, which kept them coming back. And that was, you know, a great success as far as that was concerned. 
Um, and finally, in standard motivational interviewing, it provides personalized feedback about substance use. In the modification, you might need to give feedback across different symptoms. Um, my own shameless little plug here, if I may, is um, I wrote a book called Collaborative Therapeutic Neuropsychological Assessment, which is basically a way to give patients feedback from neuropsychological tests in a simplified and empathic way that helps them understand them and helps them use that information for their recoveries. Uh, and I, I use this intervention with dual diagnosis patients, meaning patients with psychiatric and substance use disorders, and found it to be very helpful because it was information they'd never heard before, and it kind of gave them some objective information like, okay, wow, so this is my brain on drugs kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I continue to use this with my brain injury patients, and especially those who have substance abuse problems, I can kind of say to them, look, here's where your memory is now. You're in the, I don't know, maybe fifth percentile compared to your peers. If you continue to drink, uh, you know, there's a good chance that that's not going to get much better. You know, what do you think about that? You know, give them an opportunity to dialogue with me and give, open up some more avenues of, you know, us discussing this. Um, so anyway, the modification, though, is, again, feedback across different symptoms about areas that are relevant to what the patient is struggling with. So we go back to our original question. I've had a brain injury. Can I have a drink? What are some of the factors to consider that we've gone over? You need to consider the severity of the injury, the medical complications. What's their pre-morbid drinking, drug use? Um, what's their window of recovery looked like over the 12, 18 months? Usually the most recovery from a brain injury takes place within the first year to 18 months. How's that looked? Has it been basically good? Has it been positive? Or have they been having troubles? And has maybe them going back to drinking uh, negatively affected it? What's their mental health history? What kind of mental health symptoms are they experiencing now? Stress, anxiety, depression? Because uh, those have a high relationship to substance use. What are their risk factors? Are they young, male, with kind of a risky lifestyle, low economic status, not employed, no life satisfaction? I'd have a hard time telling somebody with a TBI with that profile, you, you know, yeah, go ahead and drink to dull the pain because, you know, there's a good chance that they uh, probably had pre-morbid abuse beforehand and may go back to that afterwards, which is going to impair their recovery. Do they have multiple medical comorbidities because drinking in and of itself will, you know, hinder those med uh, the recovery from those medical comorbidities along with the brain injury recovery? And what kind of social supports do they have? Is this, is this a person who has a lot of social supports, people they can fall back on, people supporting them, are they kind of, or are they kind of a loner, kind of keep to themselves, not really share much with anybody? All these are different factors to consider in trying to answer this question. But finally, what we're going to tell them is there really is no known safe level of drinking post-traumatic brain injury. We just simply don't know what a safe level is. Uh, and so therefore, we suggest abstinence is the best policy. Um, I've seen people who, like I said, have had a couple drinks here and there. It hasn't really been a big deal. I've seen other people who it sets them right back. So I'm not willing to put my patient at risk and say that, yeah, go ahead, have a few drinks because I don't know what a safe level is, and especially if they have some of these complications that I just uh, mentioned, uh, some of these comorbidities, some of these factors that I just mentioned, is going to weigh heavily on me as to how much more I'm going to emphasize that they should remain abstinence and why they should remain abstinence. And I'm going to use that information to inform them and their families about why I say that. Uh, and then I'm going to work with them as best I can to you know, try to meet that goal if they if they are willing to agree with me that that is the goal. All right, so that concludes my formal presentation. Uh, so I will stop now and see what comments or questions we have in the last few minutes. Okay. Yes, we have uh, two questions, and we'll finish up with that. Okay. Um, the first is about uh, a child who has a very high fever. Um, let's see, what degree of high fever makes a child most at risk for a TBI? When should a parent be concerned if the child temp reaches 100 degrees or higher? Uh, okay, that goes into pediatrics, child neuropsychology, which I am not an expert at and do not feel qualified to respond to. I'd, I'd be more than happy to uh, 
you know, forward any resources that I know. Um, uh, I think I've heard numbers as high as 104, 105 uh, are risk factors if it's prolonged, but I am not a pediatrician and I don't feel qualified to respond to that. Okay. And has there been any research showing the validity or reliability of these SUD screening tools with the TBI population? Um, with with the TBI population, um, not so much. With the audit, there is the audit, the DAST, and the MAST are used extensively in drug and alcohol use and have shown to be uh, fairly reliable. Um, with the TBI group, um, there is not as much information. Okay. Okay. Well, I will um, take the screen back now. So you will see that notice. And I want to thank you all for attending. Um, tomorrow morning, I will be sending out the certificate of attendance, uh, CEU order form, and uh, importantly, an evaluation that we ask everybody to please complete. It's very important for our grant and for helping us continue to bring these to you. Um, we will also have um, Dr. Gorski's uh, PowerPoint and also, again, a, um, a list of references that he supplied for us. So thank you very much, Dr. Gorski, that two hours. Thank you. You're welcome. Just uh, gone by so fast. It's totally yeah. fascinating. So at this time, we will um, close the webinar. And thank you again for attending.